Come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome. With open arms, praise God, just as I am. I come wounded to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lord. And I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Offer of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Well, good evening, everybody. Lovely to see you out here uh, again this evening to worship God together. Fewer in number, but that doesn't mean God's not here. So, uh, lovely to see you all out uh, here this evening, and we're excited to hear what God is going to say through Nelson later on. Uh, so, thank you to Nelson uh, for agreeing to do that. Just some words from Hebrews chapter 4 as we begin our time of worship. Well-known words, since uh, then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
What a wonderful Savior we have. He came and lived and died, and he never sinned, and yet he would be, he would be willing to bring us who are sinners uh, unto himself. So we praise him and we thank him. We'll stand and sing our first song, which is Blessed Assurance. Thank you to the guys for singing and playing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, want to thank you again and praise you that we can uh, meet together this evening. And Lord, we thank you that we can come and to praise you and to worship you and to bless you for all that you have done. And Lord, it's an amazing thought to think that we uh, who are sinners, who are so sinful, who have done so much to build a, a chasm between us and you, uh, Lord, you would still give us a wonderful and blessed assurance that, Lord, when we have asked you to forgive us of our sin, Lord, we know that there is no condemnation now upon us, but Lord, we are your children and we will go to be with you forever. Thank you for that wonderful assurance. No matter what we go through, no matter what we do, oh Lord, when we come and we say we're sorry and we mean it and we repent and we turn around, oh Lord, you're always gracious to forgive us and cleanse us and make us more and more like you. So Father, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we look to you this evening and we pray that you would speak to us from your word. Uh, thank you for Nelson. Thank you for the work he's put into this message. But Lord, we're praying that it wouldn't just be Nelson we're hearing, but Lord, we would hear you speak to us, hear you challenge us. And Lord, that we might understand more about ourselves and more about you. Uh, so Father, be with us, we pray. And then Lord, as we come around your table later on, would you bless us as we remember you, Lord Jesus, we remember your wonderful sacrifice for us. We remember you taking our place, taking our sin, taking our shame. And Lord, we pray that you 
would have all the glory, you would have all the honor, you would have all the praise this evening. So Lord, we praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite Adam Hamilton to come up now, and he's just going to share a little bit about what he's been at uh, this past week. So thank you, Adam. Um, good evening. Um, this past week, I've been at um, CEF Camp, which is located in Seaview um, in Kilkeel, and it's led by Phil and Rachel, um, who are workers for South East Antrim um, CEF. Um, this year, there were 41 kids at camp and 21 leaders. The camp has um, juniors and who are primary school aged and inters who are 15 and under. This year at camp, I was with the juniors, where we looked at the story of Joshua and looked at themes such as um, being strong and depending on God. The story of Joshua would um, take place in the morning meeting and then followed by a quiz, then afterwards we would have quiet time. The quiet time in my junior group was an opportunity to get to know the kids better and to answer any questions they may have, which were many, which we were very thankful for. Throughout the day, we did various activities such as games and crafts, and after lunch we had an activity such as hunt the leader or swimming. In the evening, we had our memory verse, praise time, and the missionary story on Cory Ten Boom. Throughout the week, there were various challenges. Um, however, in the mornings, when seeing the Mourn Mountains, I was reminded of the verses in Psalm 121, which say, I lift my eyes up to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made the heaven and earth. To finish, my prayer is that all 41 kids have taken something from this week and would, if they have not already, ask to have their sins forgiven. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Adam, for sharing that. So 41 kids again uh, this last week hearing the gospel, which is just great news. Um, this week, uh, Daniel Hamilton and Henry and Beth and Robert Reed have headed to New Horizon. Um, so we pray for them. A few others from the church are probably headed up there as well for the week to, uh, to, um, to experience that and to, to receive something from it. So we pray uh, that they would be blessed. Adam Dodds is still away uh, with Asia Link. Um, he had a youth weekend, was running from Thursday to Saturday. Um, and so I'm not sure what he's at again now, but we're praying that God would indeed bless him and encourage him uh, through that. I think there is also another CEF event happening this week, which is retreat. So Gemma Montgomery, she's away to that to help. And then Joel Barr and Owen, uh, some of our young people have headed down to that. So that's a young adults event. So we pray for that too. Uh, just bear that in mind. But yeah, do keep hold of your wee bulletin there and be praying through it uh, through the week. Uh, don't rush away this evening. We have a cup of tea through in the hall. So do hang around for that. Spend some time in fellowship. Then on Wednesday, uh, uh, Wednesday night at 8 p.m., we have our prayer meeting again, so do come along to that. Vincent will be sharing a word, so we look forward to that. Then next Sunday, we have Dr. Stephen McCauley from, well, he was the pastor of Kilikameen Evangelical, and so uh, we look forward to hearing him. And then we still need some help for a holiday Bible club on the 21st to the 24th of August, so bear that in mind if you'd like to help. And again, remember that we're, having, we're planning to have a baptismal service, so if that would interest you, if you're not baptized, you're following the Lord, and you would, uh, you'd like to take that step of faith, then do talk to myself or talk to Andrew whenever he comes back. I think that's all I have by way of announcements. So I'm going to invite, Vin uh, Vin I keep getting you boys mixed up, Vincent and Nelson. I don't know why. They're both characters, maybe. That's what it is. But I'm going to invite Nelson up, and uh, he's going to share with us. So thank you. The scripture we're looking at tonight is the next bit in Matthew's gospel, which is, of course, the woman who was um, suffering from an issue of blood and who was healed then. And this little piece, uh, I've never seen it before, so hopefully all goes okay. And hopefully, uh, we get this 
right here. Um, it's just a little piece about that uh, and about the fact that she reached out, touched the hem of his garment, and the result was that by her faith she was made whole. And she found what she needed in body and soul. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. If I could just touch one part of his clothes. I know I'd be healed. My sins all forgiven. If I could just touch him, I know I'd be When blind Bartimaeus was begging one day there, Nobody to help him down life's weary way. Then Jesus came by, and he heard his sad crying. He reached out his hand, and he healed him that day. If I could just touch, the hem of his garment if I could just touch one part of his clothes I know I'd be healed my sins all forgiven if I could just touch him I know I'd be whole if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch one part of his clothes, I know I'd be saved, my sins all forgiven. If I could just touch him, I know I'd be whole. We're thinking, obviously, uh, in the scriptures tonight about the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus towards uh, a woman who was suffering for a hemorrhage of blood and he was the one who healed her. And it's an expression, an example, of course, of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for us. And this next piece simply is titled, How Deep Was His Love? How far was the road up to Calvary, how dark was the night when he died, how heavy the cross that he carried, I'll never know till I stand by his side, I'll never know how steep was the mountain I'll never know till I see him above 
I only know that he sought till he found me. I only know how deep was his love. How hurt was my Lord when he suffered. How lonely was he when betrayed. How much was the debt that he settled. I'll never know, but I know that it's paid. I'll never know how steep was the mountain. I'll never know till I see him above. I only know that he sought till he found me. I only know how deep was his love. How sharp were the thorns when they crowned him. How broken his heart when denied. How bruised was his back by the lashes. I'll never know till I stand by his side. I'll never know how steep was the mountain. I'll never know till I see him above. I only know that he sought till he found me. I only know how deep was his love. How cold was the grave where they laid him. How long was the night he passed through. How much did he pay to redeem me. I'll never know, but I know that it's true. I'll never know how steep was the mountain. I'll never know till I see him above. I only know that he sought till he found me. I only know how deep was he. We turn now to the scriptures, and our scripture reading is technically from Matthew, but it's one of those cases where the same event is recorded three times, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you get three different angles on the same miracle. Now, of course, they're never contradictory. They're always complementary. Um, So what we're going to do is just read it from Matthew, first of all, and then after that, we'll read it from Mark, because the version in Matthew is just three verses. Um, You get a slightly longer version in Mark, And we'll leave out Luke because we've only got two hands and you can only hold two places in the Bible at one time. So you can't manage three. So we'll manage with two because Luke's version is very similar to Mark. So we'll read first of all from Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 to 22. And then we'll turn over to Mark chapter 5, verse 25. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him, and she touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, 
I shall be holy. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw it, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Then turning over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him, all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And we know that God will bless to us the reading of his own word. Let's pray. Our loving God and Father in heaven, we turn now to thy word and to study thy word and see what it is tonight, Lord, that thou would say to us in this passage. We thank thee for the holy scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray, O oh Lord, that tonight thou wouldst make us wise, both in regard to our living with thee and for thee, Perhaps there are things, Lord, in our lives that aren't quite what they ought to be, and we pray that thou would speak to thy children through thy word tonight. And Lord, if there are any who are strangers to thee, who yet know thee not, we pray that even this evening they might come and put their trust in Jesus Christ. We ask for liberty and health in Jesus' name. Amen. Miracles, of which this is one, are sometimes described in the Bible as miracles and wonders and signs. Now, you get different combinations of those, but in Acts 2 and 22, you get the three words together in that particular order. Miracles and wonders and signs. And miracles are indeed meant to be all three. That's why they're recorded for us in the Scriptures. And those three words aren't there just to fill up space. Sometimes when you're writing an essay at school, you have to write 500 words. You're trying to say the same thing three different ways to fill it out and make up the, the 500 words. But it's not vain repetition. It's not pointless. When it's got the three words there in Acts, there's a purpose behind them. And the purpose is this, to explain the three things that a miracle is intended to do. The first thing is that the word miracle is the word dunamis, or in English we would have the word dynamite. It's about power. And these miracles are a demonstration of the power of God. They're also wonders because they are meant to fill us with awe and wonder. We're meant to marvel at them. They certainly filled the people of that day with awe and with wonder. As they saw the dead raised, the sick healed, the blind man seeing the deaf person hearing. 
as they saw miracles in nature in the sea camp, and 5,000 fed, those were amazing things that people stood back and just scratched their heads in awe and wonder. And the third word then is the word sign. And as well as being demonstrations of God's power, and as well as being designed to fill our hearts with wonder and amazement, they are also signs of spiritual truth. Because each of those miracles is like a picture of God's interaction with man. It could be a picture of the blind man seeing. Think of the words of John Newton in the hymn, I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I was blind, but now I see. So when the blind man in the miracle is given sight, it's a picture of the person who's unsaved, who is blind, and how they are given sight by the Lord Jesus Christ. The dead person, dead in sin, who's given new life in Christ. So they are signs or pictures of salvation. And this one that we're looking at tonight is indeed a very clear one. The message in it is very simple, but it's important just to think on what it is saying to us. Jesus was on his way to heal the daughter of Jairus. He was on his way to perform a miracle. Jairus was an important man. Therefore, going to heal his daughter and eventually to raise her from the dead, that was indeed a very important thing. But still, in the midst of that pressing business, and in the midst of the throng of people who were pressing around him, Jesus still found time for this woman. He found time to stop. He found time to heal her. He found time to talk to her. He had time for the woman. And the reassurance of that is that he has time for you and for me. He has time for us. It's an amazing thing that he has time for us. There's a, a gospel song used to be called, How Big Is God? It's a good question, how big is God? I was listening to the, the news the other night, and uh, they were showing um, the shape of a galaxy away in the distance, and they had seen it through that new James Webb telescope. And it brought it up clearer because they can see further and more clearly than ever before by using it. And they were commenting on the news about how scientists were able to peer into the distance. They could see so far and they could glimpse it. And they were really excited about that. It was amazing to them that people could see so far. The truth is, they can't really make out what it is, and they're only peering into the distance. I thought about that, that they were amazed by that. Our God doesn't peer into space. Our God created it, and he oversees it. And it's not a question of looking into the distance. He can see everything. He's the omniscient God who knows and sees everything. What a God. And yet, yet such a God has time for you and me, just as he had time for the woman of all those years ago. Just three things to say about this passage tonight to break it up into three parts, simply to say, first of all, here was a woman who was in desperation. Desperation. 
This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, when you and I get ill, you get flu or something, you know, well, within five days or a week or whatever, I'll be back on my feet again, go be grand. If I get a cold, whatever number of days, uh, if I break my knee or my leg or something, well, it'll be a bit longer, but you can see the ends in sight. You know roughly how long it's going to take. The doctor will tell you. But there are some ailments that are so long drawn out that they're wearing. It's not just the pain or the condition and the effect of it directly. They're very wearing and wearing. You can't escape them. Somebody was on the news the other day. You must get the impression I do nothing but watch the news. It's probably true. Um, she was on the news and she was talking about the fact that she had a particular ailment, the state of the health service and all that, and therefore it was 18 months and she had to endure this for 18 months and it might be another six months and so on. But here was a woman who'd endured something for 12 years. And up to that point, it seemed to her that no end was in sight. A long drawn out illness that was wearing, wearying, and wearisome. And it was a particular plight. It was an issue of blood or, or a hemorrhage. In Mark's account there in uh, chapter 5, in verse 29, it says that she was healed of that plague. Verse 29, and again further down in verse 34, and Jesus refers to it as thy plague or disease. Some versions put affliction. I like the word plague for this reason. If we go back into the Old Testament, in 1 Kings 8 and 38, it tells us that you and I have a plague. It's called the plague of the heart. And that's another description for sin. Her condition was a plague our condition without Christ is a plague. Now, obviously, there was the, the physical side of her condition. Physically, it was dreaming. She would have been weak and never feeling well, and this had gone on for 12 years. So, physically, there was an aspect to the ailment, to the plague. But in actual fact, there was more than that. We'll not dwell on tonight. It's back in Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 19. But why she had that issue of blood, why she had that hemorrhage, it meant that she was not only physically unclean, she was ceremonially unclean. She couldn't take part in the worship of the temple or the synagogue. She was regarded really as an outcast because under Old Testament law, that was the situation. So here was a woman who was physically affected, ceremonially affected, and even beyond that, socially affected because the Old Testament law said that if any person came in contact with her, if there was any possibility of them being touched in some way, then indeed they too would become unclean. So she was isolated socially. Nobody wanted to sit beside her. They didn't want her to come into their house. They didn't want anything to do with her. And you can think of the sense of isolation where for 12 years, You've had no real proper social interaction with other people. And so physically, ceremonially, socially, she was unclean and an outcast. It's a 
a picture in some ways of our sin, you know, that word unclean. We'll be singing later on the hymn, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. That's what we are by nature because of our sin. It's been pretty gloomy there so far, but there was one positive thing in this. She was a woman who had a disease and knew she had a disease. She knew it. Couldn't avoid it. She was bound to know. And she was trying to get a cure for it. There are many people today who have that plague of sin in their hearts, but they don't know it. They don't acknowledge it. They don't recognize it. They've been struggling to explain what sin is because it doesn't feature in their thinking. Because God and the Word of God don't feature in their thinking either. And there are people who sometimes have an illness. And if you have an illness that's a painful thing and you go to the doctor, at least you're doing something about it. Even more troubling is the person who has an ailment but isn't aware of it until it's too late. She knew that she had a disease. She was trying to find a cure. But many live today in ignorance of their sin and leave it too long and too late. Many people would struggle today outside Christian circles to understand what sin even is. Talk to unsaved people quite often. She was trying to have a cure, finding a cure. And it says there that she had suffered many things of many physicians, verse 26 in Mark 5, and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. She had not suffered many things of many physicians. The other week, Mary and I went down to Castle Ward to the National Trust property on the principle that if you've paid your annual subscription, you want to get the maximum value for your money. So we go to as many of these places as we can over the summer period. And one of the things that struck me at Castleboard this time that I hadn't seen before was not some grand piece of sculpture or some piece of architecture, but it was a little cupboard off to the side. And when you went over to the cupboard, and Mary saw it first, and she called me over to see it, and it was absolutely full of Victorian medicines. Little brown bottles with faded labels covered in dust and strange concoctions. And goodness knows what was in those concoctions. There were these strange concoctions in the bottles. Now, I don't know what medicine was like in Victorian times. I just know what it was like in the 1950s when I was a child because they, they seemed to give you medicine on the basis that the more painful and the more unpleasant the taste, it was bound to do you more good. And sometimes I wonder if it did you any good at all. I was Googling this afternoon to see if they still made muster oil. There used to be the uh, muster oil and there were a couple of other things. And if you had a cold, they used to put it in your chest at night when you were going to bed. They slapped it on, nice and thick. And they put brown paper on it because if it got through that, it made the stain to your pajamas and you didn't want to have to they knew the pajamas. So you got this brown stuff on your chest. And all I think it did was it burned the skin off you. I'm not convinced it did you any good for your chest at all. But if it was like that in the 1950s, and I saw what it was like when it was down at Castle Ward in Victoria and in Edwardian times, you can just imagine what medicine was like 2,000 years ago. Medical knowledge was primitive. So I can well understand when it says there that she had suffered many things of many physicians. Not only had she suffered many things at their hands, but she had spent all that she had. Now that brings me back to the word I was using, the word desperation. She was so desperate for a cure that she was willing to spend her last penny to 
get a cure. But it was just one disappointment after another. It's a bit like the way people try to find peace and contentment and satisfaction and so on in the world today. And they'll try one thing. It may go for a while. And then they'll want to try something different and something else and something else. And the truth is they're never going to be satisfied. And they're never going to find peace, no matter how many times, one thing after another. And it's the same with salvation. People will try one thing after another. They'll decide, oh, it's getting on in life. I begin to think about eternity and better go to church. They'll try that. And they'll try maybe giving to the church. And they'll try something else. But they never have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And without that, there's nothing. She had one disappointment after another. Neither could she be healed of any of them. And Mark tells us, that's in Luke, and Mark tells us, but rather she grew worse. Her situation was deteriorating probably because of the disease and possibly because of the treatments that she was getting. But here was a woman who felt helpless and hopeless. She was at the end of herself. Of course, when it says she grew worse, isn't that a bit like men and women quite often? They put off salvation. And as the years go by, hearts can grow harder. They become very, very hard indeed. And not only do hearts get harder, but sometimes sin gets deeper. And she was helpless. She could buy no help. She had no money left to buy any more help. And even if she had, she was hopeless. Desperation. The second part of the passage deals with her transformation. It doesn't leave us there with the black picture. There's a transformation in the life of that woman. Many people crowded round Jesus that day. They thronged or pressed round about him. Probably for all sorts of reasons. I suspect some people were just curious. Those were simpler times. Life was different. Today it would require almost like a, a worldwide advertising campaign and all the rest to get people out for things. But in those days there were no distractions. They didn't have television and newspapers. They didn't have all the things we have today. And if something happened, it soon draw a crowd. Would draw a crowd. John Wesley used to talk about going around on horseback, and all he had to do was ride into a village. Get off the horse, stand up on something, start to preach, a crowd would gather. Why? Because nobody ever came to their village. They never saw anybody else. And it was the excitement. They were Somebody has arrived. They were curious. And I suspect that curiosity was part of what drew people there that day. They had heard a bit about Jesus. They had heard that he performed miracles. They had heard that he was a powerful preacher. And... They were curious to see what would happen. There were many people who crowded around him that day. But the passage tells us that there was only one who reached out and touched him. See, there are many people who come to church, who may read some Christian literature, whatever, they, they crowd, they're part of that crowd around, they're in, on, in the suburbs, if you like. But they're not getting to the heart. There was only one, this woman. Because she was so desperate and knew her need, she is the one 
who reached out and touched him. She could have made many excuses that day for not doing it. She could have said, well, he's on his way to the house of Jairus. He's a very important man. I'm just an insignificant character. No. Some other time. Or she could have said, I'm not really supposed to get into a crowd of people because I'm unclean and they'll become unclean. I should really stay away. She could have thought of a thousand excuses for not meeting with Jesus that day. But she didn't. She was so desperate that she set aside every argument and every excuse and came by faith to Jesus. He was there to heal a poor woman on his way to heal a rich child. And as the chorus says, you'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. Verse 27 and verse 28 tell us that when she heard of Jesus, she came in the crowd behind and touched his garment. It seems to have been a pattern for people to touch the garment of Jesus. Later on in chapter 6 of Mark's gospel and verse 56, it says, And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Matthew and Mark say his garment, but in Luke's version it says the border of the garment or the fringe of his garment it is in a number of other versions. And the question, I suppose, is what does it mean by the border of his garment or the fringe of his garment? Of course, the, the answer is found in the Old Testament, Numbers 15 and Deuteronomy 22. Uh, if you go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 12. Chapter 22 and verse 12 says, Thou shalt make thee fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture, wherewith thou coverest thyself. As I say, it's also there in more detail in Numbers 15. There was a fringe of blue tassels, if you like, attached to the fringes of the garment, to the border of the garment. And their purpose was to remind the Israelites that indeed they were to keep all the commandments of the law because that's what the tassels represented. They represented the law and the commandments. And so it meant that as they put the garment on or took it off, they saw the fringe and it was a reminder of the law. It says it was to be a blue fringe. And in fact, Jewish people still to this day, when they're, certainly when they're praying, um, I've seen folk put on a, a garment of that nature over their head to um, remind them. So it was a particular garment. And I suggest that it says something about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, fulfilled the law. He was perfect in every way. He did no sin. He knew no sin in him. There was no sin. He was sinless. That's why he could be a sacrifice for our sin. And that reminder of the, the little tassels, a reminder of the law of God, which he kept. She touched it as he passed by. Now, touching the garment wasn't the significant thing in terms of it being touched with her finger. What is significant is was that she was touching his garment with her faith. It wasn't the finger that was important. It was the faith. She touched him 
with her finger, more importantly with her faith, and that was her way of expressing her faith that he could heal her. Mark 5 and 29 tells us immediately the flow of blood, the hemorrhage was stopped from that moment. Immediately, from that moment, it stopped. Tells us, does it not, that Jesus is not only the master of the impossible, he's the master of the immediate. In that moment, he healed her. In that moment, she was converted. You get some people who are, make claims about healing and uh, somebody gets a wee bit better and they're saying, well, that's, uh, that's um, uh, proof that what I do is right and so on and, and bit by bit. But it's interesting, when Jesus healed somebody, it happened immediately. It happened immediately. He's the God of the impossible. He's the God of the immediate. She was healed immediately, just as we can be saved immediately. The thief on the cross didn't have to wait for a while. He was saved there on the cross. You might argue that because she was so concerned about touching the hem of his garment, was it that she was imperfect in her understanding? And that may be. But if her understanding was imperfect, her faith was more than adequate. There are lots of people who come to the cross and to Calvary, come to Christ and are converted, who don't really fully get every little bit of it. They're not going to. It may have been that her understanding was imperfect, but her faith was more than adequate. She had paid for help and received none, but here she receives complete help, free of charge. That's a good thing, free of charge. Salvation from sin, likewise, is for you pay the doctor. And if they do away with the health service, we'll pay the doctor even more. But in those days, you had to pay the doctor when you went. Salvation, however, free of charge for everyone because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Here's a woman who came in desperation, who underwent a complete transformation. And briefly, just in finishing, she had a conversation with Jesus. Jesus, in verse 30 of Mark 5, tells us there, Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him, turned him about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now, I would suggest that Jesus knew, well, he was aware of it enough to turn around to know that the person was behind him. It wasn't somebody to the side who had put their hand through or somebody in front of it. He knew the person who had touched him was behind him. I would suggest he knew who it was. But still, he asked the question, who touched my clothes. There was a purpose in the question. He wanted to engage with the woman, and he wanted to explain to the crowd. He didn't want her to be just healed and slip away quietly. He wanted to have that conversation with her, and he wanted the crowd to understand. It's also a point, I think, for us, the usefulness of a question, because if you look in the Gospels, many times Jesus asks questions. Uh, put a question put to Jesus, quite often he'd answer it back with another question. Uh, and that's a very wise thing. Questions are really useful, whether it be to answer somebody else's question or sometimes to direct and start a conversation. If we're talking to others about spiritual things, quite often we're so busy. Now, let me tell you, because I know, that's, that's quite often our approach. We, we understand how, how it's meant to be, and we start. But quite often, asking a question is one of the best ways of engaging people. I used, well, we have, I say we used to, we have a friend 
who was very good at going round doors. No matter what the purpose was, she was really good at getting conversations, going with people. Even if they looked as though they had no interest at all, she had that unique way of asking a question and they felt they had to answer it. And we don't ask enough questions in our conversations with others. It's just a little thought there on that side of things. But the question was asked, who touched my clothes? Invitation to the woman. Now, the disciples, of course, they immediately barge in. They're not waiting for anybody to answer. They're straight in. In verse, um, the next verse there, they say, um, the, the disciples come in, in verse 31, the disciples said unto him, you, you see the crowd throwing around you and you're asking, who touched you? That's a stupid question. They were basically saying to Jesus, how would anybody, how would anybody know? The disciples were rash. And Luke tells us the first of them to do it was Peter, which isn't surprising. Peter was always the one who rushed in and was rash. Jesus looked round in verse 32. He looked round about to see her that had done this thing. And there you had just the two of them, Jesus and the woman. There was a crowd round about, but really it was just Jesus and the woman. Someone once said, God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us to love. And verse 33 says, she came fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, and she came and fell down before him, and she told him the whole truth. She told him everything about her situation, her plight, her background, and what she was experiencing. I wonder, was she expecting a rebuke from Jesus, perhaps? Because she had been so long and clean and isolated from people, and here she was in the midst of a crowd and touching his garment, which was not something she would have done previously. But Jesus, at that very moment, answered her in verse 34, and he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. There in verse 34, he speaks to her. And he makes it clear to her that it wasn't the touch of his garment that made the difference. It was the fact that she came in faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we're told we're saved by the grace of God through faith. In 1 Peter 1 and 5, we're kept by the power of God through faith. Faith is right at the heart of that relationship between the believer and Christ. And so he told her, and in truth he told the crowd standing around because they were within earshot, that great gospel truth by grace are we saved through faith? And the words that he used there, behold, can it mean as well not simply were you healed, but you were saved. You see, he dealt with her sickness and her shame, but he also dealt with her sin. So you have a double blessing in body and soul. If you're a Christian tonight, you'll be able to look back and think of days of desperation when you were without Christ. You'll be able to think of that transformation. Transformation from death into life. From sickness to wellness. The conversation will be a bit different because today you'll be thanking the Lord for what he has done and you'll be talking to him a long, nice journey. But if someone tonight is still in that state of desperation without him, then the first step is that transformation. And it brings you out of the old way, helpless and hopeless, 
on dong on clay into a new life, a new way with Christ as your Savior. By faith hath made thee whole. By grace are you saved through faith. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank thee for the Holy Scriptures tonight. And we thank thee for what thou hast said to us through thy word. Make us, Lord, to be responsive and submissive to everything that thou hast said to us individually tonight. And may thy spirit continue to apply thy word to our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nelson, for uh, sharing God's word with us. <clears throat> Well, we'll stand and sing uh, a song here. We'll sing as the, the one that Nelson mentioned earlier, I stand amazed in their presence. We'll stand and sing. Nelson's been talking about, uh, for those of us who have experienced uh, God's love in that way, for those of us who have our sins forgiven, we're going to meet 
uh, around the Lord's table. Now, I'm not telling anybody who's not a Christian to leave, but uh, we're going to spend some time and, uh, and, and we'll take uh, the, the, the juice and the bread to remember what God has done uh, for us. So that's open to anybody who is a Christian, anybody who is in a right relationship with God is willing to stay and partake. You're willing to stay if you're not a Christian, but just don't partake and just uh, let the, the emblems pass you by with no shame at all. But if you're walking with the Lord, then you're welcome to stay and, uh, and we'll share the Lord's Supper together. But let's pray and then there'll be a few moments of getting this all sorted and then we'll meet back together in three or four minutes time. So let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for the story that we read in the Bible that we've been thinking about there of you, Lord Jesus, just taking time out to, uh, to turn to this woman and to uh, reward her faith with salvation and with healing. And Father, what a wonderful, gracious act that is that you would, uh, you would bestow upon us healing for our sin. And Father, that you uh, would bless us and bring us into your family. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, be with us now as we meet round your table. Oh, Father, would we uh, be blessed in remembering the wonderful sacrifice you, Lord Jesus, gave as you took away our sin and gave us new life. So, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.